Assalamu alaikum everyone, my name is Muhi Khwaja with American Muslim Community Foundation and today on the Muslim Philanthropy Podcast we have on Zainab Abbas who is the founder and CEO of SciTech to You. Welcome to the show. Thank you, nice to be here. Of course, I'm really excited to have an opportunity to chat with you and learn more about the organization and about yourself. Um, so if you don't mind sharing more about kind of your background, where you grew up, what, mm -hmm. where you went to school and all that information. Okay, sure. I am from originally from Ghana, which is in West Africa. My father came here um, to work with Voice of America. So I grew up um, in Maryland, suburbs of Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. I went through from elementary through um, high school here. And then I went to Knoxville College, which is a small HBCU in Knoxville, Tennessee. And then I did my graduate work at um, the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. After that, I worked for Procter & Gamble for about six months, then worked for Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, DC. Then I worked for um, two non, um, I'm sorry, two biotech companies in Maryland suburbs, um, not too far from where I re reside now. And then that was for about uh, almost seven years, a little under seven years. And then I worked for another biotech company for about eight months. And then I worked for a for-profit college for nine and a half years and then founded um, SciTech to you. Wow, so definitely combining your resume into one project, it sounds like, um, and, and that's really exciting. Um, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your, your dad's role in, in the work that he did um, and kind of how that influenced you and what you wanted to do as a career. Wow, so my father, he, he was a teacher before I was even born, and then he got into journalism and he worked in Nigeria for some years. I was very young. So that was, you know, I was kind of like out of there that um, in terms of what he did. And then he um, applied to um, for positions outside of Ghana. I think Russia was a place, I think maybe for BCC and VOA, and then he ended up choosing VOA. So, you know, he packed up the family and we moved to Maryland um, back in the 70s. And he's been a radio journalist ever since. And um, actually my father was a little influential in what I did when we were young. We didn't have the internet, so we had encyclopedias. And um, I would always open up encyclopedias and read you know, different things about different things, different subjects. And one day I, I read that um, heart um, issues, heart problems were the number one cause of um, death in America. And I was like, I'm gonna be that one that's going to, you know, cure it all and become a doctor and, you know, help people not die from, you know, heart, heart disease. And so that was basically the impetus of me kind of moving into STEM. But there weren't any real programs for me to kind of venture into. So a lot of my STEM education happened when I got to college. I mean, I you know, I took anatomy and physiology in high school and um, took some chemistry courses, regular biology courses in high school, but I really got into biology. I majored in pre-med biology in college. And then my, the end of my junior year over my, uh, before my senior year over the summer, I did a Ronald McNair program at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And that was a full summer program, very intensive. And I did research in the lab of Dr. Villafane. And that's when I was like, aha, I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be a research scientist because they're the ones who really do the research to find the cures for all of these different diseases. And um, alhamdulillah, I finished that program successfully. And after my senior year, I got um, accepted into um, the University of Cincinnati Medical School research program. And I worked out of the um, Children's Hospital Research Foundation in Cincinnati. And I worked in Dr. Lassar's lab where I did a lot of um, research work with um, actin, which is a muscle protein that actually, that was the early days of transgenics. And they knocked out, before I got there, they knocked out the actin gene in the heart. 
and replaced it with the actin gene from the stomach and to determine if that would rescue not to bore you with the details, but that's kind of how I got started. In no, that's research. super fascinating. Yeah. 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 Um, and really dynamic background. And I love how the curiosity just stemmed from an encyclopedia. Um, so, mm. you know, props to you for really following through and committing to that um, all through your education. Um, so... You. I, you know, definitely you have a wide variety of backgrounds and, and now I'd, I'd love for you to focus on kind of um, why you founded SciTech to you. And so I founded SciTech to you, actually, you know, many people ask me this question. I used to tell them, oh, I worked at, you know, the college and there are a lot of underrepresented students that didn't really know about biotech, blah, blah, blah. So I give them the story, which is true. But I was one day forced to, I sat through a workshop and they really forced me to really get to the heart of why I started SciTech to you. And it, that experience took me back to a day um, at the college. Um, I had my first semester there at the college. I had a student that wasn't a very good student, you know, for all, all intents and purposes. He was late. And sometimes he wouldn't even come to class, but the days that he was in class and he applied himself, I was like, wow, this boy really has potential. You know, if he just applies himself, you know, to the work. So uh, maybe a few weeks in, I pulled him aside into the glassware room, you know, where we keep all the lab materials and I gave him a good talk to, it's kind of like away from everyone. So I gave him like a really good talking to something similar, you know, what a big sister would say to her little brother or a mother would say to her son and like, look, you have potential, you're really smart, you're doing good work, just kind of, you know, apply yourself and do well, come to class and take care of business and you can finish with good grades and, you know, be successful. And I think he took that conversation to heart, like someone really cared enough about him to give him that talk. So. After that, he, you know, he applied himself. He came to class on time. He came to class all the time. He did the work. And in the lab, the students, you know, they keep notebooks. We teach them how to maintain a professional lab notebook. And um, over time, you saw his work, you know, like maybe D and F work move to like just basically straight A work. And I was, you know, I was so impressed. I was so happy. Um, two weeks in, um, the president of the school came to my classroom with two plain clothes police officers and um, arrested him and took him out of my wow. class. And that was heart wrenching. That was heartbreaking. Every time I talk about it, it just takes me back. Um, the first time I, you know, spoke about this experience, I was in tears. You know, my kids were running to me like, "Mom, what's wrong?" I didn't realize how you know, emotional I was going to be when I was telling this story, but um, that's, um, that's what happened. And um, I, I couldn't tell them that, you know, it was that he's gotten better and, you know, he's a different person now. And, you know, it was, there was nothing I could do. I just felt helpless. And I, at that yeah. point, I think in my mind, that was the impetus that um, started SciTech to you. Yeah, that's a really challenging story because, you know, if you, you I was hopeful in hearing that trajectory. And then, you know, unfortunately, it's a it's an ending that, um, you know, wasn't the yeah. outcome that I had hoped for. Right. Um, but now it's a powerful moment for you to really look at what you can do differently. Um, so what what were some of the things that you started uh, in terms of programs and services at SciTech to you to hopefully um, engage more students earlier on or um, show yeah. them their potential? Yeah, so I, for him, it was too late. I wanted to do something and it was too late. So I thought to myself the best way to, you know, reach, you know, students like him is to start early. So I started SciTech to you where I work with K through 12 students. Um, I started with nothing. I mean, I didn't know where to start in terms of nonprofit. So I just took the little money I made at the college and um, put out, you know, a letter, hey, look, 
this is I take to you. I started this program. I even kind of rallied some of my students at the college to help me come up with the name. And so anyway, we I started with 10 students. I um, actually rented a room out at the masjid. Um, I started with 10 students and the first um, ever program I did was a molecular biology program. I taught the kids about DNA. They made sugar because, of course, DNA has a sugar molecule. So, you know, they learned that, you know, sugar, most of the sugar in the United States actually come from sugar beets. Um, they made um, DNA models. They extracted DNA. They, we did the central dogma, how DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein and then the cells and the tissues and so on. So we went through that whole central dogma process with the students and they loved it they even made like a code because dna uses a code to make protein so they made codes using their names right so that make, makes it fun and interesting and something that they could take they made um beads with their names on it and um were able to experience it it was a full week program and one of the things i try to do is like there are many other programs like mine that exist but um, I try to offer the program for, if I can free with, you know, with funding, I can offer it for free, but at very, very low cost is um, what um, I try to offer the programs to the students and just give them that experiential learning. Majority of the programs like mine cost, you know, upwards of $200 a week or more. And I, you know, try to, charge $50. And for those who can't even afford my program, I just kind of give it to them for free. And, um, you know, I don't really, I don't pay myself anything. It's just I try to invest more in the students and the kids just so that they have that experience. Yeah. And so, you know, going from that first um, program of 10 students, um, you know, what, what year was that? And then kind of how have you grown over the years? Yeah, that was back in 2011. And um, just this past year, um, we've served so far since um, COVID. Actually, last summer, I didn't teach. I didn't, because of COVID, the pandemic, we have to pivot like everyone else had to pivot. Sure. And how they do things. Um, so I used the summer to kind of pivot. And um, we did an after school program and um, we did a winter program. We did an uh, Excel program where we teach students um, data analysis. Um, and we did a STEM Fest and I've served just under 200 students. So to date, we've served um, 195 students um, from 10 to 195 students. That's really phenomenal. Um, yeah, it, and um, I was going to add, we we teach a wide range of disciplines. Um, in our after-school programs this year, we did um, aeronautics, and the students got an opportunity to fly a plane 2,000 feet in the air. They um, went to iFly, where it's, it's indoor um, skydiving. They dissected um, grasshoppers. They made airplanes, parachutes. Um, rockets. And then in our winter program this year, the students did a, a chemistry. The elementary students did um, perform chemistry. They made slime. They made uh, pH solutions. They've made um, artificial skin. They made soda. They've made um, uh, uh, breathalyzers. They tested their breath and breathalyzers. They, so they've done that, and then that's the elementary school students. And then the middle and high school students did um, robotics. So, so they we use the itty bitty robot and they learn how to code robots. They, um, they made three, they made a monster, a, a, a move, movable car, a ladybug, a sloth, different renditions of the, and then they could add their Legos as well to it and extend it so that it had engineering Interesting. also component to it. And um, so it's, it's, if you're familiar with uh, Arduino, it was like a micro Arduino. And then the end of the year, um, of end of the, uh, in January, beginning of the year, our um, after school program, they learn about circuitry. The elementary school students learn about circuitry. Our middle school students use snap circuit with circuitry. And then our high school students use um, 
at Arduino. They learned the fundamentals of Arduino and started coding. So if you're familiar with that, you know, that's what they're doing. This summer, we're looking to, to uh, teach our students robotics using uh, where they learn electrical engineering, they learn coding, and there's it's called the hand. So we're looking to use the hand to um, teach the students a lot about, you know, mechanical engineering, ro robotics. It has a robotic component. It has electrical engineering component. And of course, there's a lot of math in that. Um, in the past, we've done um, environmental, where the students have done so developed solar um, robots. They've done wind energy. They've done civil. They've done um, it's just so much that they've done. Um, what, what else have we done? Uh, anatomy and physiology. We've done oncology. So it's just, we try to cover all disciplines of STEM. Yeah. So you have that science, you have that technology, you have that engineering, you have that math and even art, you know, mm -hmm. attached to it. So they'll make models of, when we've done um, anatomy and physiology, they've done heart models, they've done brain, they've dissected the heart, uh, sheep's heart, they've dissected sheep's brain. Wow. They've also, you know, make clay models of everything that they, you know, that they dissected. So, and then of course there's fun when we have our summer camps, you know, there's fun involved as well. They get an opportunity to play and um, just enjoy themselves in summer programs here. Um, it's gotten to a, to a point where we didn't have enough funding. I held it here at my house. So they got to enjoy, you know, jumping in the trampoline and just enjoying themselves water balloon fights. So. I just try to make it fun for the kids and they experience, you know, they, they have that, they, they're they immersed in STEM and they don't even realize that they're learning and their parents, you know, they're like, oh, they did so-and-so in school and they, you know, knew it from your program or they're doing so much better in school. It's just the feedback that I get just keeps me going. That's really Helps awesome. Me. I, I'm just amazed at the depth and breadth of the services and, and programs. And, I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, I would be genuinely interested in learning all of these things. Um, so I, I think it's a really awesome uh, service that you're able to provide. Um, and I'm just thinking as well, like, you know, there's so many opportunities, whether it's like a, a mosque locally that has a Sunday school or a weekend program that can come and take these courses from you or like a boy scout troop that can come or a girl scout troop that can come and learn all of these different things um so mm -hmm. have you tried partnering and advancing or you know what does your organizational structure look like um you know yeah. you've been able to grow it over the last few years mm -hmm. but um you know what are some of the challenges that you see uh mm -hmm. leading this nonprofit, and and what are the barriers to that growth yeah, actually, it's, I mean, I've done a lot and it's kind of sort of just been me. Just this past year, I've been able to secure a, a volunteer, which is who's a recent graduate from um, uh, Howard University in biology, majored in biology, minored in chemistry. So she's, you know, has a really strong background. And my son also volunteers. He's an aspiring mechanical engineer. He's, you know, in high school. But um, I have, 10 members on the board. And before it was just about three members on the board. So we've grown. Um, basically, we've been growing exponentially since our beginnings. And in this last year, I mean, people really came through for SciTech 2. But a lot of what I've done, like I, I teach the course, my volunteer teaches the course, and my son kind of assists where we need it. Um, so it's just been me. We definitely need funding to build our capacity. And I have partnered this year with two organizations. One organization is SGAP Leaders, which is an organization of Student for uh, Global Achievement, is Student for, for Global Achievement Program. And they're a social justice program. And they talk about, they look at issues that um, deal with environmental justice, um, Black, Black, Black Lives Matter, something that's, you know, very new in front and center. Um, DACA, which is another issue. Um, 
gentrification. So um, a lot of those issues they look at. So we provide STEM kits for their students to use in school. Another organization that we partnered with is a fairly new organization that came out of COVID, which is the AFIA Project. And it's an organization that look at women, um, mainly Black Muslim health, you know, in Prince George's County, Maryland. And she does a really good job with looking at, you know, maternal health. Um, she has SAT programs that she offers to students after school programs, looking at, you know, different aspects of health, mental health, um, physical health and well-being. And we're looking to partner with them this year for our summer um, school program. They'll offer the physical education, the art, and we'll offer the STEM. And um, we've partnered up a lot of our um, after school programs kind of came out of that program. So we've, you know, we've worked hard to try to reach out. We've, sp we've spoken to some um, Girl Scout troops um, we're reaching out, we've sent uh, our programs, we advertise to local masjids, and a lot of the students, majority of the students that we get are Muslims, about, um, I like to say about 95% of our students are Muslims, so we're reaching out, we just need to build capacity, we need a lot, you know, especially during this time, it's hard to get volunteers, because a lot of people are struggling themselves, so we need to build capacity. Um, so that we can pay people to help us. But right now I'm working by myself and two volunteers and my board members. Yeah, that's definitely challenging. And I think many nonprofit organizations can resonate with your your story as well. Um, you know, I think another mm -hmm. um, opportunity that, of course, when you have the time and capacity to look into is, you know, just local school um, mm -hmm. Uh, districts, right? What are after school programs yeah. that you can be providing? And I think that there would likely be a really good opportunity there too. Uh, but of course, all of that comes with you need a grant writer for the proposal to then submit yeah. to this and that and the other. Yeah. And there's so many things. Yeah. But I think you'd be able yeah. to successfully find a lot of opportunity there. Um, and hopefully, yeah. even in the DMV area, uh, you know, DC, Maryland, Virginia, if mm -hmm. there are foundations that are funding STEM or children or education mm -hmm. or youth or any sort of thing, um, I think that SciTech to you would be a perfect candidate uh, for all of those opportunities. Yes, it's, I mean, looking for grant is like looking for a needle in a mountain of hay. I mean, <laughs> these days, it's, it's, it's very hard. And I spend, I think, majority of my time, you know, a good chunk, not majority because programming and teaching, but a mm -hmm. good chunk of my time, my free time, looking for grants. I mean, I do it every day. If I'm not looking, I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, there are, you know, I speak to people and they say, oh, there's so many grants out there for STEM, but <laughs> some of them are very specific. It's location specific. Totally. And because we're a small organization, it's almost like we have to go with a bigger organization, maybe get a fiscal sponsor or something like that. But, you know, it's hard to, especially during COVID too, because everybody is looking, right? And, you know, a lot of people had to lay off their um, employees as well. So it's, 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 a, it's a tough time. But I think what we need, I mean, just this year, it's a testament to the need for SciTech to you. Right, and um, I want to say that you know, SciTech to you is in Montgomery County, Maryland, is the only Black female Muslim-led STEM program in the county, and we definitely need you know we need the support. We yeah, need the support. And for sure. I need someone to help me find grants, write grants, and um, fundraisers. Just everything. I really need to build capacity, and you know, our services are needed. I mean, our services are needed. Um, we've gotten one grant where we used to get the STEM Fest from Discovery E and the Shauna M. Soros program. And I started out with 25 students. I bought 25 kits and I got more and more parents asking. So I had to buy 12 additional kits just to, you know, take on more people. And then I had to turn some people away because, you know, the fund ran 
low, but you know, it's something that's greatly needed. And everyone on there, like one of the mothers is like, please let me know what I can do. I'll write a curriculum for you. I'll, I can even teach a class. Awesome. Yeah. Our kids enjoy the program so much. They're like, even after the program, they use the kits to do other things with, you know, to kind of continue that experimentation. And this is what SciTech to you brings. You know, I had another mother who had, you know, the first time student in our winter program. And she said, you know, her son, you know, went home and went to school the next day and um, the following week. And what they were covering in class was exactly what we covered in SciTech to you. And he was, you know, he did well. That's awesome. I've had parents come to me when we had a weekend program. They're like, my parents, my kids don't want to wake up in the morning on Saturdays, but they're waking me up, you know, on Saturday mornings to take them to SciTech to you. Yeah. So these, these are the type of feedback that we're getting. So it's it's tough for me to you know kind of do it alone, but the parents' feedback encourages me. Um, our last after school program, we actually had a college student participate in our program because she's been a student that's kind of been all along, and she heard we had a program. She's like, "Oh, sign me up! I'm joining." So this is, you know, this is what we do. That's really awesome, and you know, my advice to you and other people who may be in similar situations is try to create a development committee on your board of directors, even if it's just getting Mm -hmm. that one, two, three extra people who can help with sourcing the grant opportunities. Um, There's Mm -hmm. a system called the Foundation Center, and they have a directory online. So you could really target, say, you know, this specific county or the DMV area Mm -hmm. and STEM and youth Mm -hmm. and kids. And then it'll spit back a report to say, these are the foundations who are funding in this area. So, you know, just like anything, it takes relationship building and opportunity and networking and all of that. But I think if you are able to implement those few things, then you can try to get a more clear path. Um, And then of course, like people listening here, like, if they can volunteer, if they're local to you, if they can help in any way, I definitely encourage them to find out more about SciTech to you. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously there's always potential amongst fundraising to individuals, um, mm-hmm. but I'm sure you guys are working on that as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity in uh, that fund development area um, that, and, you know, if you did need a fiscal sponsor, AMCF could easily be that for you. But I think at the same mm-hmm. time, if you have that longevity and you have your financial documents and you have everything in place, like, mm-hmm. you know, we need to empower organizations to do it themselves because there's always going to be a fee for a fiscal sponsor or there's always going to be yeah. um, something else involved. Yeah. And, w- and we want to get the most bang for the buck um, to to your project. So. Yeah. yeah, I am familiar with the Foundation Center. I mean, I used to kind of go there, sleep there, do everything with them. They actually um, part uh, merged with GuideStar, and they're now Candid. So I'm right. very familiar right. with the Foundation Center. And I've used them. Again, it's, you know, it's difficult. You either have to be, I mean, sorry to say, but you have to be a lot of times locally. You have to be Jewish or in Baltimore or Catholic. Or, you know, just kind of be this or that. And that kind of, you know, pushes out, push us out. I mean, last year, you know, alhamdulillah, we were able to get a $10,000 grant from um, the state of Maryland Department of of Housing and Community Development. So that really helped us out a lot with the after school program. And we are also able to get the Shauna M. Sorrells grant. And we got the grant from... um, Discovery E. And then we've had fundraisers. I've found that, you know, a large support that comes to us is um, from individual donors until we can get, you know, big enough to be recognized by the, um, but believe me, I've applied. I mean, recently I've applied um, to Ford. I've applied to Subaru. I've applied to, you know, the big organizations with the, with Dua. You know, I'm hoping continue to do it. I'm always searching today. I looked at, you know, some Toshiba has some that's going to open up in May. I'm searching. Like I said, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack and a big mountain of hay. But yeah, 
I continue to search and have my committee, fundraising committee on my board that's also working to help, you know, search for grants and raise money. So it's more it's power tough, to you. Yeah. We're, we're working on it. I think, you know, you bring up a good point about like being the right type of organization from a cultural or religious mm -hmm. perspective or this, that, the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I honestly do believe that like the time is now for mainstream philanthropy to look at marginalized communities, um, you know, women led organizations, black led organizations. You're obviously both of those components mm -hmm. and looking at how mainstream philanthropy can commit more resources to support those organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you know, inshallah, we'll see that trajectory uh, come through. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to, um, you know, give you an opportunity to share if you feel like there's anything else we didn't cover um, before I ask one of my favorite questions uh, to all of our guests. Yeah, I think, I mean, we just, I mean, I need support. I thank you so much for having me here and letting people know that we exist. I think one thing you know, maybe um, we can do better is kind of letting people know that we exist and that we need the support, you know, from our community. So I really want to thank you for this opportunity. And there are probably many other organizations, you know, similar in a similar position that are really, you know, we're really doing good work trying to help the community, um, trying to help the UMA, the society. And we just need to be recognized and um, be supported, you know. So thank you very much. Of course, we're happy to uplift uh, organizations like Size Tech to you um, and bring them on the podcast, uh, put them in our nonprofit directory, share our best practices and resources with them. Um, so, you know, I, I applaud you for your leadership in, in the community every day. Um, Thank you. So one of my favorite questions is always asking our guests, um, what are three causes that you mm. give your sadaqa or zakat to? And um, feel free to share. Yeah, um, I give to the local masjid. I give my sadaqa and zakat to the local masjid. Um, my family, you know, Every year we give to the homeless. We do um, hygiene packs. Mm. I mean, a lot of times, you know, you'll find a lot of people giving, yeah. you know, homeless food. But, you know, really they need hygiene packs. You know, a pair of socks in the wintertime, gloves, hat, scarves. They need, um, you know, some sanitary soap, especially now, sure. hand sanitizers, um, face masks. So we do that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, every year, me and some of my sister friends, we always go and cook at the Ronald McDonald House as well. That's you know, great. For family with kids in the hospital. I mean, we, I, I give to a lot of different organizations. I mean, I could, you know, they run, it runs the gamut, but I would say those are my top three um, Seneca and given, of course, outside of Psytec to you, I give my time and my for effort sure. into Psytec sure. to you. But outside of that, you know, Masjid number one, and you know, those who don't have like the homeless will probably be number two. Um, I wish there were orphanages around; they don't exist anymore. But um, I, that would be somewhere where I would like to invest. We look up, given to foster organizations that support support foster children as well. So. Yeah, those are where I give maybe. That's really inspiring. And I love hearing the different, um, you know, work that you do. And even beyond SciTech to you, um, it just serves as a reminder for, you know, all of this motivates me so much to keep doing what AMCF does because I see it as a need and a resource to the entire community. Um, and when I get to chat with people like yourself, it just reinforces that. Um, so you are an inspiration to me and I hope to all of our listeners as well. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, and I mean, good work. Keep up the good work. I mean, this this is what you do is needed. So much what AMCF does is so much needed in our community. So thank you. And 
that's also inspirational, you know, for me to keep going, to know that, you know, we have someone, an organization that, you know, support us and care about what we do. So it's, um, it, it's motivating to yeah, know that you're sure. here as well. And, yeah, you know, you. we're dedicated to like the nonprofit ecosystem, the donor ecosystem, just really this entire philanthropic ecosystem. Um, and we're, we're happy to do it. We have a really great team behind us and in, in the board of directors and um, other staff members. I just luckily get to sit on this podcast and chat with mm-hmm. awesome people. <laughs> yeah, um, nice. So, yeah, I mean, you know, people can find out about SciTech to you online um, at SciTech, the number two, the letter U dot org. So SciTech to you dot org. Um, on Instagram and other places, SciTech to you. Uh, Zainab, it's been a fantastic honor and pleasure to chat with you about the community work that you do. And thank you so much for, for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Of course. Take care. Thanks, Chuck. 